Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good, live from Iowa Catholic Radio's Mercy Live Up Studios. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you live from these United States and various parts across the globe. I'm here in Des Moines, Iowa, where I'm the director of uh, the Zeed Institute for Foundation and Ethics and Leadership and director of Mission and Ministry at Mercy College of Health Science. You can find us at ZedaInstitute.com and mchs.edu. Bud, out there in Pittsburgh, what are you up to? Yeah, Bo, I'm coming to you from Duquesne University's campus today. I I teach a course here and had to be on campus for some meetings, so I'm buried deep in the halls of somewhere. <laughs> of somewhere. Where, uh, like, yeah, Duquesne, you know, uh, what river? Don't you have to pledge allegiance to a certain one of the three rivers when you're in Pittsburgh? Like, each, each place has a, a river it fights for, and you're known as... Like I'm making it more like Harry Potter, I realize than it probably is. Yeah, the rivers to me gets com- get get confusing. I know there's an Allegheny, and I know there's a Mahogany. Uh huh. Maybe in Ohio, we're, we're the confluence of three rivers. It used to be five, but human beings paved over a couple of them. Well, apparently. I <laughs> I just am like really digging the idea that like there's just rival gangs and they they fight for the the pride of which river they're associated with but i suppose not everything can be as cool as pittsburgh as uh the uh uh the the french fries on salad so it's just wishful thinking that's right yeah i i gave a talk last night at westminster college which is north of pittsburgh and they were asking me about what i've had to adjust to and i said uh, the, the the driving like the traffic but then also Potatoes on everything. Potatoes on everything. Well, uh, you know, as always, we're underwritten uh, by Cartridge World, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights. Um, I suppose, Bud, that if people, you know, wanted you to write a flyer about what you're getting used to, you could map that all out um, using uh, ink that you get from Cartridge World. Uh, Anybody else that needs, you know, have all of your printing needs ready, Cartridge World is the place to go. Yeah, Cartridge World, also, I think, crucial for the holiday season when you start thinking about Christmas cards and whatnot. But they, uh, the great thing about them is there's environmental printing. They've got uh, deals for business customers, including pickup and delivery. So some, some great people over there at Cartridge World. Always, as uh, we're underwritten by Mercy College of Health uh, Sciences here in Des Moines, we just got done last week having uh, our Faith and Healing series. Dr. May Sim came in. We had a really great turnout. We appreciate people who came by and got to see us. Um, we're in the smack dab in the middle of the semester, and the reason I know about it is we started our eight-week accelerated course uh, mm-hmm. this week, and uh, that's uh, it, its own thing. But, you know, if you uh, have previous BA experience and you want to get in and out of uh, a nursing program and start your career, uh, you, you a lot of other conditions because it's very intense. But, yeah, we have the accelerated uh, program. We have 40 people um, doing it. So that's one of the new things at uh, Mercy College. Um, but... All sorts of ways that people can get in, whether it's just certificate programs, year-long programs, all the way up to three years. Uh, Mercy College of uh, Health Science, uh, providing Iowa and then people in different states through their online programs the ability to serve others through health sciences. Yeah, when I think of Mercy College, one like the idea that immediately comes to mind is agile. You guys are agile. Oh, right. Yeah, and like <laughs> providing all sorts of ways for uh, busy professionals to get to get a degree that I think will, you know, take them to the next stage in their career. So it's pretty cool. Eight-week pro- eight week arrangement, you said? Yeah. that's wow. Like, speaking of Agile, what that reminds me of is uh, <laughs> that running back for Purdue who uh, helped oh, yeah. Purdue demolish Ohio State. And I have to admit, Bud, um, part of me, uh, this is probably going to, like, you're, you're going to be – uh, maybe taken aback because I know Nebraska is having a historically difficult year. But, you know, we have a lot of Oklahoma State fans who are complaining, mm-hmm. even though we still technically are above 500 ball. And yeah. I have to admit, part of me liked, uh, you know, being al- like, you know, almost 10 years ago, right, where uh, all you had to do was run through life. And if you could upset the big dogs at Oklahoma State every so often, people were real happy. So yeah. maybe maybe success is its own uh, bitter pill that people don't realize. Well, I, I noticed you guys are on in prime time this Saturday. Yeah, the we, old Texas Longhorns. Yeah, and uh, what is interesting, so I don't know how good we'll look playing, 
um, but will look good while playing because uh, they're wearing the throwback jerseys to uh, Barry Sanders' 1988 uh, Heisman mm-hmm. season. So it's like really old school 80s uniforms that they're wearing, and they look pretty awesome. Yeah, well, you guys do unis right. I'm impressed. Um, as as a Husker, we're not we're not very creative, but you guys definitely pull out all the stops. Do you think that all of these problems, but are because uh, is it like every Adidas team is being cursed by God because of the weird shady stuff going on with uh, the the FBI investigation and payments? I wouldn't be surprised. I'd like to blame it on that. That's what you're going to go with. <laughs> yeah. Um. So today we yep. have. Uh, uh, Kathy Duffy. Kathy Duffy has an entire website I'm looking at here. Uh, Kathy w- Duffy Reviews. She reviews homeschool, uh, curricula, extras. She just also uh, interviews books in general. Um, but she has a book out with Tan called Everyday Evangelism for Catholics, a practical guide to sp- uh, spreading the faith in a contemporary world. And she's who we're going to have on the show today. Yeah. So, you know, like when we think about our show, one point that we've tried to press over and over is there's not these different spheres of life, like my private religious hobby and then what I do nine to five. And I think, you know, for Kathy, one thing that she's trying to press is um, the call to uh, to share the good news with with each person falls on each Catholic. Um, it's, it's so integral to, you know, it's the last command that Christ gave to his apostles. And so uh, I think the book blends I've been looking through it. It blends like sort of really practical advice with some good theological grist. So we should have some things to talk about today. So that's what we're going to talk about today. You don't want to miss it. This is the Uncommon Good. Stick around. And after we get to these messages, we'll be back with Kathy Duffy, author of Everyday Evangelism for Catholics. We'll be back after this. The eagle feels slighted, Jeb. I don't know. Yeah, so Jeb, uh, I don't know. Did an eagle do something to you this past weekend during a... Carathon? No, he's just laughing now. Okay, so <laughs> if you want to talk about the show, for instance, Keep the Eagle, uh, Everyday Evangelism, anything like that, you can use the Zip Whip line. Uh-oh, <laughs> we're having computer problems. There we go. 515-223-1150. That's 515-223-1150. If you text in on the Zip Whip line, we're able to see it. It comes up. If you do hashtag UCG for Uncommon Good, we can even answer questions you have later. The Zip Whip line... 515-223-1150, 515-223-1150. This is The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. We'll be back speaking with Kathy Duffy, Everyday Evangelism for Catholics, after these messages. Everyone lives their life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. How we use that time directly affects if our life will leave a significant impact or not. Every year, Blessman International leads teams of Central Islands on 12-day all-inclusive experiences filled with life-changing personal interaction with the beautiful African children that we serve. Teams are forming now for 2019. Space is limited, so make a decision today to use your time to do something significant in the life of an African child. Learn more and apply for a trip today at www.blessman.com blessmaninternational.org. Thank you, Farm Bureau agent Cindy Schulte, for underwriting Catholic Women Now. As an authorized independent agent, Cindy's team can provide health insurance options from Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa. Cindy Schulte at 1315 50th Street in West Des Moines or on the web at cindyschulte.com. 515-226-2111. Cindy and her team know health insurance. Walmart Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa is an independent licensee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Products available at Farm Bureau Financial Services. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts. 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400 and online at cartridgeworld.com. Thank you, Dental Associates, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. With over 40 years' experience, Dental Associates is a group dental practice with the mission of promoting optimum health and well-being to all patients, providing preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Message underwritten by Dr. Kenton Gleichman, Dr. Steve Karbaka, Dr. Christine Mulcahy, and Dr. Ben Nagel. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Today we have with us 
Kathy Duffy, author of Everyday Evangelism for Catholics. She's a cradle Catholic. She spent a number of years worshiping at evangelical churches, but after her reversion, Kathy developed a passion for encouraging other Catholics to be intentional about sharing their faith and how that you go about doing that. Um, you, another way that you can uh, interact with her work, she has kathyduffyreviews.com that I'm looking at right here, and there are, uh, I don't want to you know get it in the ballpark correct, I hope so, but I think a million reviews <laughs> of uh, homeschool curricula. Kathy, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm actually worried, a little afraid that if I told my wife, uh, we homeschool, if I told her about your website, <laughs> I might not talk to her for a while. <laughs> well, that's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kathy, thank you for coming on the show. Everyday Evangelism for Catholics. Uh, I was really attuned to the idea about every day uh, in the title. I, I grew up my uh, evangelical and converted um, later. I think sometimes when people get the idea about what does... What do evangelicals do different than us, or or what do you do when you do evangelism? They think of um, uh, maybe programs, uh, maybe like a, a whole you know edifice that they have to like memorize or transfer. But it's everyday things, and I sort of appreciate the fact that in making a book that is trying to reach Catholics in this level, you focus on every day. What made you think to make that your first word in this book? And that really goes back to all the years that I spent in the evangelical world where I absorbed that mindset that even, you know, being an evangelist is part of who you are as a Christian. It's part of your identity. And so I brought that back with me when I came to the Catholic, when I returned to the Catholic Church. So, it, you know, it kind of was there when I came back to the church and found that other people weren't thinking that way. I wasn't terribly surprised because I had been raised Catholic as a child. You know, I wasn't terribly surprised by that, but dismayed and how do we change that? So uh, I came back to the church in 1998 and have been working in some aspects of evangelism ever since within the church. And this book is a culmination of, of what I've observed and the needs I see of how the average Catholic can actually be an active evangelist. Kathy, this is Bud Marr, and one of the great things about your book, uh, I think, is um, you share a lot of your stories, not simply from your spiritual journey, but also um, being boots on the ground in Catholic parishes. And one idea that you refer to at different points in the book is um, you, you sort of caution Catholics against settling for maintenance over mission. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems like a really key idea to what you have in mind for the task of evangelism. So, so what do you mean when you say, like, a parish is focused on maintenance, and how do we move beyond that, like, in a, in a really positive direction? The maintenance-to-mission concept is one that I've borrowed from, I'm not sure who he, maybe Father James Mellon or one of the, the Divine Renovation <laughs> line of thought. We're very much in that um, mode in our parish. So, you know, the the job of the parish isn't to just simply maintain what you're doing there for those who show up, the, you know, the long-time cradle Catholics, but to be on mission, and the mission is the Great Commission, to bring people to Christ, share the gospel, bring people to Christ. So um, that's what it's about. That's what the mission is. I think sometimes people, you know, not to go too far into a history lesson, people can ask, like, why? how, how did Catholics end up this way? Um, and as like I said, someone who converted and you, you start reading through the history, it's, you know, it's hard for people to realize that when like, you know, Dante is writing the Inferno, right? Or, or even just 200 years ago in Italy, where maybe, um, some of the Catholics here in Des Moines, for instance, came from everyone in town was Catholic, right? Like, like, right. yeah. So, so that's a different sort of world and that involves different things. It transfers to the United States and then we really get this sort of American parish system, that really still ends up being mostly um, ethnic, not completely, but, you know, people from different parts of the world settle in America, and then they go to, uh, you know, church with people that they're used to. And so they bring that mindset, even though it's not necessarily completely the case in the United States. They're like, well, we're all Catholics here. And so, you know, then, but maintenance isn't even that. Maintenance is sort of a deterioration of even that, because now we live in a world where there isn't that sort of presumption um, even about your family, right? Like it, it might be the case that um, almost no one in your family uh, is still Catholic, but we think that what like the job is just to sort of hold the fort down and hope for the best. And I think that that's what your book 
allows people to start to reimagine is since times have changed, uh, the faith never does, but we can. And that that's the hope we have in looking at the world is it, it's not like we're living at the, the end of the church, but we are living in an end of an era, but an era pregnant with a rebirth that's possible. Yes, definitely. I was thinking about this just the other day. This is not in the book, but the um, idea of religion consumerism. We are, in the United States, very much a consumerist society. Mm -hmm. I think most people would grant that. And it carries over into our attitudes toward religion. You know, we go to a church and we want to be fed, we want to be entertained, we want to, you know, feel like, you know, our needs are met. It's all about us and what we want. And that's not what it's supposed to be. We are supposed to be practitioners of religion. I was thinking of a good analogy would be a medical practitioner. He, a medical practitioner is bringing health and well-being to other people physically. Our job with our faith is to be religious practitioners, that we are bringing the good news of the gospel so that there is spiritual well-being to other people. And it's a very different mindset about what church is, what faith is, than most of us were raised in. And um, I don't, you know, trying to get people to grasp that mindset that they are on a mission, they have a job to do, they're not there to simply consume, is I'm, you know, calling for a sea change, and I'm not the only one. Um, but this is what we're after. Yeah, Kathy, I think that's such a crucial point, and. You know, for for myself, I have to be honest, I I get kind of nervous sometimes when we start thinking about bridges to people who are outside the church, because uh, like, like Bo, I, I grew up evangelical, and I saw, like in some ways, an evangelical context, they'll talk about being seeker-friendly, right. and I saw <laughs> that justify a lot of things. Like, <laughs> if your goal is just to be seeker-friendly, and we say we want people to be comfor comfortable, like as they walk into the church... Like, there's there's one thing about being welcoming, and there's another where, like, that space is no different than, like, the shopping mall, right? Right. But I, I think what you're saying goes, it's like it's more nuanced than that. And I guess what I have in mind is, like, in terms of putting flesh on the bones for our listeners, what are some parish contexts where you've seen Catholic communities do this well, and, and what what did it sort of look like? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I have not seen whole entire parish communities doing yeah. it terrifically well. I think we're just starting to get the idea that we should be doing it. In our parish, we're, we are really doing a lot compared to most other parishes, and yet, you know, I see all of our shortcomings. We're doing the Alpha program, which we've put, I think, about 1,500, 1,600 people through so far. Um, and that's a that's a basic alpha, the beginning of the gospel, the basic proclamation of the gospel to people. And you incur, you know you invite people, invite non-believers or people who've fallen away from the church, and this video discussion, a meal, and that has worked quite well in drawing people into a relationship with Jesus, and then. The hope is to take them further into a relationship with this church. It's a long process. It's yep. challenging within the Catholic context. But um, we're doing that, and Alpha has been a springboard in our parish to get people to start thinking evangelistically, learning how to pray spontaneously with people, how to listen to people. A lot of the things I talk about in my book but it helps, it's a training ground for that, because those are so essential. Um, evangelism, we have this mindset that we have to be apologists, we have to have all the answers, but typically people aren't looking for tons of information, but they're looking for uh, a deeper spiritual experience, sense of belonging, a sense of um, the, the, the transcendent. There are so many other things that people need. And listening to them and finding out where they're at and responding to that rather than what we think they ought to know is so much more important. So in our parish, what we're seeing is that people are learning how to do that better. So, for instance, all of our Bible studies, people are supposed to end in their small groups praying for one another at every Bible study. 
and then we see more people praying spontaneously with one another, for instance, in the church courtyard after Mass or um, you know, at other times, that people are more willing to just stop and pray with each other and not wait for, you know, oh, we have to go to the priest or we have to do some, you know, some formal thing. So that's the kind of thing that we see happening. Yeah, the I think one of the questions people might have is uh, when we talk about the the sort of theme of our show and talking about social teaching and just, social justice, and people go, you know, well, is evangelism sort of like? I think they they akin, they make it akin to marketing. They think like, oh, evangelism yeah. is sort of like religious marketing, and so it's always just a matter of like what makes people, like you said, want to consume the product. Um, it's actually quite the opposite, it seems to me. Evangelism is precisely about the fact that out of justice, uh, Christ, who is king of all the universe, but particularly the earth for which he died for, um, by divine right, uh, deserves followers. And so when we think about being servants to Christ the king, the king of our uh, society, of the church, of heaven, um, it falls on us to do the appropriate thing, the fitting thing, the thing that is his by right, which is to say he deserves more and more people worshiping him, more and more people following his law, and more and more people spreading his love through their actions. And if people flip this around and see evangelism almost more like marching orders, right? That right. In, a, in a way, what we're doing is establishing beachheads for the reign of Christ the King, um, that maybe this all takes on a very different flavor than simply, uh, you know, personalities or, or marketing or, or pretty pictures or whatever, and, and gets yeah. more down to the battle we're actually fighting here. Right, yeah, and, you know, bringing people, you know, that's, bringing people under the, the kingship of God, you know, this is one thing, but we can also think of it in terms of the relationship, and we can think of ourselves as matchmakers. We're trying to help people fall in love with with Jesus Christ you know um the relationship part of it is is so critical and you know i was thinking about this because of your show you know the the common the uncommon good what is the common good in this you know if we if we love people if we really care about people we want god's best for them and god's best for them is for them to be in relationship with him and we should care enough about people to want to share with them how they can do that, how they can have that relationship, how they can have eternal life. Isn't that the best thing we could want for anybody? Yeah, Kathy, um, sometimes when I – so I, I reached out to Tan Books to, to see if some of their authors wanted to, um, to, to come on the show, and we're so grateful that you made the time. Um, and sometimes when I recruit a guest, so to speak, Bo, Bo will say, like, well, how are we going to you know, connect this with the show? Because we – we we try to like stay on on target and on note, you know. And one one point that you make as an aside in the book that I really think does uh, connect back to the common good and Catholic social teaching is you you point out that for many individuals in our society, a real barrier to hearing and responding to the gospel is their family life. And there there's so many um, broken marriages and broken families, and you know, with the church's teaching about the indissolubility of marriage and things like that. This can be just sort of a sticking point uh, for, for, for folks. And I guess what I have in mind is uh, it feels to me that as Catholics, by fostering the common good, and that begins with um, uh, the Church's teachings regarding marriage and family, in some ways we're, we're sort of laying the foundation or laying the groundwork for, um, for people to hear the good news. But do you, do you have any stories or, like, um, how have you navigated? I feel like sometimes... And talking to young people, like say here at Duquesne University, it's not so much that they have like an intellectual barrier to the faith, but there's elements of the church's moral teachings that right. uh, there's ideas that are so pervasive in our society that it's almost like, oh, so you follow like a, a bigoted religion, right? And how right. do we how do we sort of navigate those waters? <laughs> I, th- I think that's some of the toughest. Um territory to deal with because you know we're you have to deal with the sexual issues uh the uh, same-sex marriage and um you know just all, the, all all of these all of these areas yeah. even even within the church we we don't really address so much 
uh, very common issues with in vitro fertilization and um, you know there is so many so many of these areas that uh, people on the outside think you know you're just crazy if you don't get it like the yeah. rest of society and so those are generally not our starting points if we get people to uh, first consider the reality of God and relationship that he loves them, if they can grasp that concept, then it's easier to go into some of those areas. If you start with those, you're just going to turn people off. Well, Bo, I think you can sort of speak to our time teaching together at Mercy College. One thing that did surprise us, though, is it, it, the default position is to assume that Catholics have no good reasons for the convictions that they, they hold about these matters. Right, right. But, Bo, wouldn't you say that when we actually presented our students with some of the argumentation behind that, they were at least like, wow, you know, this yeah. isn't just an arbitrary command that's been imposed from on high or whatnot. Yeah, you know, one thing I think is important, <clears throat> and certainly um, uh, I'm I'm more than willing to, like, uh, import some of my um, experience uh, as a Protestant into the Catholic context. One of my favorite things growing up Southern Baptist hearing is that preaching is supposed to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I wish we could do that more. However, there's one mindset that I think is so pervasive in the United States religion, and this is a practical way in which I think most Catholics are actually Protestant by default. And there's this idea that, like, religion isn't um, sort of, uh, it really is just sort of like, well, I kind of by sheer will decide in a sort of consumerist way that I'm going to follow this religion. And so there really is no consideration about, you know, why I follow what the dictates of the religion say, except that they're dictated. Right. So like when you decide you're going to do whole 30 or, uh, you know, whatever, like of the, the, the myriad, uh, uh, you know, diets you can choose. There's some people who will like go on and like try to really defend their belief. But the idea is right. Like, well, you got to have a diet and you stick to the rules because that's what you do. And it either works or it doesn't. And people treat religion this way. Well, when you get a chance to be the witness to someone about why it's actually the case that we have these like full anthropological arguments for why we teach uh, human sexuality like they do, like we do, I don't think it's necessarily that people are going to immediately, like, uh, you know, at the snap of a finger convert, but they're at least troubled in a really good way. Because, and I think, Kathy, you probably w would get to this too, what we're trying to show people is there's a very different way to understand what it means to be human. So it's even anthropological when it comes to evangelization. It's not only like, here's what the religion does, but this is like a new life in Christ, and that really that has to be seen uh, instead of just like you said transmitted, uh, you right. know, through like a, a course or a pamphlet. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking, you know, if when you've got a classroom of students, that's one thing. You've got a somewhat yep. captive audience. When you're talking to a family member or someone that you'd like to see return to the church or come to the church. Uh, then you, you know, you, <laughs> you have to tread a little more lightly. And it's very delicate how you get into the subject to get them to even sit to listen. Um, but then again, I, th I think most Catholics don't have any grounding in theology of the body and don't really know those arguments that you're talking about. They don't know the information um, about the beauty of the Church's teaching on these issues. And they feel tongue-tied. When somebody asks, they feel challenged and oftentimes j just don't get it themselves. So I think it's, it's yeah. tougher for the average person in a normal conversational setting to deal with those issues. Well, that's kind of a, a great stopping point we've got, or up against the break. But maybe when we come back in the second half of the show, we can talk about um, where to begin in these conversations, how to equip ourselves well you know, balancing uh, that fine line between um, knowing the faith and the reasons for our faith and not, not falling into kind of an anti-intellectualism. But we're so grateful to have Kathy Duffy on the show today. This is The Uncommon Good. We'll be right back after these messages. That's right, bud. If you want to make sure that people have a way to interact with the show, maybe keep the conversation going, talk to people about what's going on, see upcoming events. Uh, we have the full gamut of uh, social media in which you can be a part of. If you go to Facebook, 
Uh, just look up Iowa Catholic Radio. You can friend us and follow us. The same thing with t- Twitter at IA Catholic. Uh, I uh, excuse me at IA Catholic Radio. Um, you can follow us. Uh, argue with Jeb. Jeb, don't you check the account? Okay, yeah. So you can throw jabs at Jeb, which is I that's the only thing I was going for is to be able to say jabs at Jeb. Um so get get in your jabs at Jeb at IA Catholic Radio on Twitter or Catholic Radio Facebook and like we said on the zip whip line five one five two two three eleven fifty on any of that. If you do hashtag UCG we'll know it's for the uncommon good and we'll try to get back to you uh that way as well. So make sure to follow us, make sure to keep pestering Jeb. And make sure to let us know uh, how you uh, what, what you can do. And then one last thing, I want to say thank you for everyone who donated to Carathon last week. This is the Uncommon Good. We'll be back after this break. Impoverished children break everyone's heart, but poverty seems like such a big problem. What can one person do to make a difference? For 17 years, Blessman International's passion has been to connect the resources of our donors with sustainable programs that impact the lives of impoverished children in South Africa. Our donors are feeding thousands of hungry children every week, providing basic water and sanitation for impoverished communities, and sharing the love of God in practical ways every day. Go to www.blessmaninternational.org and make your donation today. Hi, this is Tony Calumet. Our next Man Up event is coming up Tuesday night, November 13th from 520 until 8 p.m. at All Saints Catholic Church here in Des Moines. It's going to be moderated by Father Sean Kilcally, who is a nationally recognized speaker on theology of the body, human love, and pornography addiction. Father currently serves at the Diocese of Lincoln and brings hope and healing to individuals, spouses, parents, and clergy who have been affected by pornography. Don't miss this one. Register today at iowacatholicradio.com. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts. 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400 and online at cartridgeworld.com. St. Vincent de Paul's assists those living in poverty to become self-sufficient. Learn more at svdpsm.org or call 515-282-8327. This message brought to you by Homemakers Furniture. back with the uncommon good Bo bonner and dr bud marr we have with us today kathy duffy author of everyday evangelism for catholics also you can check out our website kathy duffy reviews uh, dot com kathy thank you for joining the show on the second heart part of the hour i'm glad to be here so um if i recall correctly bud um we left out actually kathy yeah. just a, a side note bud is usually really good at asking completely open into deep philosophical questions like a, <laughs> a minute before the break so but I actually think you set this one up really well, so I'm going to let you uh, uh, throw up the alley-oop to continue the rest of the show. Well, um, Kathy, one point that you were making, I think, at the end of the first half of the show was about being equipped, and your book uses this, uses this language as well. And I know in speaking to Catholics, or even someone like myself who, who has a degree in theology, you can get nervous about, like, is the conversation going to go somewhere where I don't have the answer? Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is especially the case, you know, uh, so let's be honest, Catholic's way of confession, usually evangelical Protestants know more of Scripture than we do. They probably right. packed more away in terms of memorization. So, you're, you know, I've heard stories of people on the subway, on a bus, and, uh, you know, and evangelicals maybe reading the Bible and the conversation turns to the faith, and all of a sudden, like, do I have the right litany of verses um, memorized to answer this guy's questions. And I guess for myself is, what is the balance there? Because on one hand, um, not all of us are called to be so, uh, educated theologians. We are called to know our faith to the capacities that God's given us. Um, but you've also talked some about relationships. So like, how do we kind of balance that, um, that, that, that sort of like um, tension between not having all the answers um, bringing it back to God's love for us, but also not falling, <laughs> I'm throwing a lot of things on the table, not falling into kind of an anti-intellectualism where it's just all about this kind of emotional response to God's love. Yeah. What I find is that 
most of the conversations I get in, and I get into a lot of conversations. I find opportunity. I look for opportunity. I pray for opportunities <laughs> to get in those conversations. But most of the time, people uh, you, you, listening to them is the number one tool we need to listen and then to ask probing questions to help them think through what they believe. Very few people have a well-developed worldview, theology, uh, understanding of where their belief, what their beliefs are and where they lead. And so we can ask those probing questions to help them reconsider what they think they believe. And that doesn't take a lot of Bible verse knowledge or, you know, theology, yep. but more common sense. Uh, maybe knowing the truth of what we believe, yes. Uh, you have to know where you're going, where you want to help them end up. But, uh, you know, do you, you know, do you even believe in God? And sometimes you can start a question if somebody's talking about a, a difficult situation they're in. And you don't know whether they believe in God or not. You might just say, have you ever prayed about it? And that question, how, depending on how they answer it, you, can, you will know whether they believe there's a God, what kind of a God, is it a God who might answer prayers, um, or they, they often have not prayed about it. And uh, sometimes you can just offer to pray right then and there with a person, and it opens them up to the possibility of, oh, maybe there is a God who cares about me, yeah. just by simply taking time to pray with them immediately about something that's going on. It's a very subtle and direct evangelism, but probably more effective than lots of other types. Well, so, I was listening to a talk recently yeah. by Edward Sri, and it was this great story where he was getting on an airplane, and uh, someone recognized him from the, um, oh, he does a show on, on yeah. EWTN these days, and uh, Sri was saying, this guy walked up to him and said, when we get up in the air, could I speak with you about the faith? And Edward Sri was really excited, like, oh, you know, and the, the, the evangelism came to me, like, God's brought this person in my path. And it started out, like, when they got to 30,000 feet very congenially or whatever, but then all of a sudden uh, this guy turned and said, like, when is the Catholic Church going to join the modern times? And, like, <laughs> who are you guys to tell us we can't do this, can't do that? And Sri said it, it really took him aback, and, like, the plane kind of went silent, and everyone was waiting, like, what's this Catholic apologist going to say about contraception? But he made a point that I think relates very much to your book, where he said going into those conversations, uh, it's not like you're saying to yourself, I'm not going to provide an answer, but you, you go into the conversation with the default position that I'm always going to bring it back to God's love. And so, like, when we think about the moral teachings of the Church, what he says, you know, is like, God is a loving parent who knows what's best or what's required for a happiness. And if you kind of, if you have a conviction about that, you can be patient and listen to the badgering because we, you, you know that if, you know, if this life is embraced, that it contributes to true happiness. Mm-hmm. Now, Bo, you just hide green scapulars in people's drawers, right? Yeah, <laughs> I have done that. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes when people raise questions, especially the most challenging questions, yeah. they are not really interested in the answer to that question. Mm. There's some deep hurt, some personal experience behind it, um, you know, how can God be so, you know, you know, how can he kill all these people, or how can he, you know, in the Old Testament stories or something yeah. like that, you know? And that's not the real issue. Maybe um, their dad abandoned the family when they were young, and their concept of God is this, you know, dad who runs away, and so they hate God because they hate their father. But if you start responding to the Old Testament story question, you're going to be, you know, spending a lot of energy in the wrong direction. And so this is where the taking time to listen and ask questions first yeah. gets you to the heart of the matter. Where is the real issue here? What is it that's going to win this person to, to Christ? It's it may be not at all what you think it would be. I think one thing that's important, too, for people to recall, and this is a big theological point that can sound ivory tower, but I really do think it plays out in everyday life again and again, um, what we can say positively about God, cataphatic, the via positiva, um, is limited. It's limited to what God himself has revealed. Um, and there's ways in which all positive statements 
almost always come with caveats because of how uh, the limits of human language. So even when we say God is our father, you can imagine someone taking this to be quite silly. You're like, oh, does he tell dad jokes, you know, or something silly like this, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But the biggest deal, the best thing that we do is actually say what God is not, what Jesus is not, and what the faith is not. The questions that I think everyday evangelists can usually do mm-hmm. is dispel errors people have about us. And the reason I'm confident that you can do this is because you don't necessarily, you almost never have to have a technical answer. You can just point to the practice of the faith. So when people go, I heard you worship Mary, you go, and they go, you go, well, why do you think that? And they'll go, well, you have a picture of her or a statue. And then you can go, well, don't you have a picture of a sports player, right? Or Mm -hmm. isn't there statues outside of the stadium? And those are things that I think, when people right. get nervous, they think their job is to like re- reproduce the catechism in layman's terms at a drop of a hat. But usually it's just to be like awake and aware enough of our faith to be able to mm-hmm. dispel the worst and silliest ideas people have. Yeah. And sometimes that's all it takes. And so when people, you know, are like pressing this issue about like, you know, the conquest narratives in the Old Testament, um, it, sometimes it just takes to be like, okay, it's not my job to prove what we're supposed to do with the book of numbers, but maybe that we can dispel this idea that somehow we are like, you know, like weekly praise, you know, this violent God, which obviously isn't true. Right. Yeah. There's, there are so many different aspects of this that people get into uh, the problem of evil, one of the biggest ones. And, you know, there was a, a, Painting, a painting, you know, I'm not even sure how he made it. Um, a survivor from Auschwitz had done some amazing artwork afterwards, but he had an image that sticks in my mind so much. And it's an image of Jesus on the cross, but kind of hanging upside down up in the air with all of these bodies and skulls stacked above him. And Jesus is just weeping as he's holding up all of you know all of the suffering humanity on top of him carrying that burden and to me that image speaks of god's attitude about evil you know that that he died for it that he carries our pain for us and i find sometimes talking in images and things like that rather than um just the intellectual answers speaks to people's hearts better than we could do with other words. Yeah, and, and kind of building on Bo's point, but I think tying it back to what you've said, Kathy, about listening well, I, I really liked in your chapter chapter on, on worldviews and worldview comparison that, again, like Bo's saying, the temptation can be, I have to demonstrate my entire worldview. But, it, but a point that you make in that chapter is that sometimes when engaging those questions, actually what's really helpful is uh is asking a good question. So you point out things like like asking someone, like, what do you think happens when we die, or what is the purpose of life? I think a big one when we get into, like, ethical issues is, uh, like, asking someone, well, well, how do you think, like, how do we know right from wrong? And as they begin to talk about their perspective, sometimes they sort of land on mm-hmm. what we're trying to see, have them see anyway, right? Yeah, or they they find themselves in a tangle and and realize they don't have any way to defend what they believe. Yeah, so in these conversations for yourself, I, I guess like drawing on your own personal experience, like when do you actually move to a point where you say like, "Could I pray with you?" <laughs> um, I might pray. It depends on where the person's at and what seems helpful. I might pray with them very soon in the conversation uh, about something they're suffering through. That can be a, an easy entry point, yeah. uh, but usually, usually after you've taken time to develop some trust and really, you know, with a perfect stranger, you know, it usually takes a little bit longer than that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah but uh, it's being open to the leading of the Holy Spirit because it seems like there just comes a time when, uh, yeah, well, of course, let's just pray about this. Um, Kathy, one thing that I, I think is interesting, and I, I would love to—we're getting, you know, on towards the uh, the break and closer to the end of the interview. But I, I wonder sometimes about some of the generational differences that uh, evangelism starts to take. And, and what I mean by this is, I know there's a way in which uh, and part of it is like 
older people have kids and sometimes grandkids and jobs. And there's this idea that you'll hear some people try to make evangelism like, you know, your life that you sort of like, but you have a few holes in, you know, this Christianity can really spruce it up and Catholicism can fill in the gaps. But I, you know, because I do a lot of, uh, in a college and just sort of the other venues that I teach at, I run into a lot of young adults. And when you think of worldview, um, what I hear behind even some of the sort of jaded, pointed questions at the church is a lot of dissatisfaction with the current worldview the younger you go. Right. And, and it starts to be interesting because mm-hmm. one of the things that we get pegged for is we're sort of like the positive, happy, always smile, be stoic and okay with whatever happens to your religion. And, you know, I find this kind of odd because, you know, I like the prophets or I think about Jesus overturning the money tables and things like this. Um, there almost seems to be a way that with the young, actually we're the ones really uncomfortable with thinking about um, maybe some of the radical implications of what the faith asks for us. Do you think that that's something like a, the pre-work of evangelization is for people to take time to say, what what is what real way is Jesus pushing me in my current life uh, so that I that I can free myself enough um, to to talk with uh, younger people about this? Um, <laughs> I am my impression is that a lot of younger people are looking for purpose and meaning. They're so lost. And and it's not just the you know like the twenty year olds. I think it's you know teens up through their forties. So many of them uh, have no sense of direction, purpose, why they're doing anything. And that they they seem more open to the conversation than older people. To me, I find it easier to get into conversation sometimes with younger people than older people. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly. That that question went round and round, and I'm not sure where <laughs> <No problem. laughs> where else you wanted to go with it. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, Kathy, I'll put you on a spot for another tough question, I think. Um, should we try to convert Protestants? Because I'm sure in talking to Protestants, sometimes they'll say, well, I already have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. So what is what are those kind of conversations? Yeah, like? well, okay, I don't think we should use the word convert because okay. they have that relationship with Jesus, and some of them are in a better place with in their relationship with Jesus than we are as Catholics. So um, it's not conversion so much as bringing them into the fullness of the faith. I, I like that term because, although it's awkward, but, um, yeah, we want all that God wants for them, including his church and the sacraments. They're missing out on the special channels of grace and, you know, that's all that's available in the church, the sources of truth and being able to sort things out with some clarity. So we want that for our Protestant friends, and I have I have lots of them. So um... Since we're doing sort of like popcorn evangelism now, uh, we did young people and Protestants. Fallen Away Catholics present like a unique group as well, too. And I know nice. from working at a chaplain at a VA hospital, I think one thing that's tough with um, sometimes speaking to fallen away Catholics is in the Catholic faith, rightly so, like our relationship to God is so much mediated through an institution. And so a lot of times, like we've talked about, if someone's been harmed in some way by a leader in the church or by a member in the church of the church, it can um, it can leave them scarred just even in their perspective towards right. God. What what kind of conversations or how have you gone about speaking with fallen away Catholics? We've seen a lot of that, and people have misconceptions about the church. Um, oh, uh, you know, yeah, I, th- I think there are more and more fall- fallen away Catholics. We're we're finding them coming back through Alpha. They're in in the Alpha course. They're finding that they can have a relationship with Jesus they never had before, and it's it's blowing away some of their misconceptions about the church. But I think bringing it to that personal level is often the key for those who've left the church in the past, praying with them, mm-hmm. making God real to them, making religion not the thing you go to and, the, you know, the church does it and you just observe, yeah. but bringing it down to a personal level often draws them back. But it's not so easy. I'm finding more and more fallen away Catholics have gotten into uh, invalid marriages and mm. other situations that really complicate the situation. Yeah, that is but tough. No easy answers there, yeah. but, you know. 
Well, I, and that's the thing I, I to, to you know wrap up the interview here is um, what what your book does is admit that there's no easy answers, but that there's a lot of hope to be had and that mm-hmm. it's not an insurmountable um, or even sort of technical or professional preparation that we need to do. But like you said, one really steeped in prayer and giving ourselves the time to stop and ask, um, what do we want uh, to do to honor God? What do we want to do, like you said, to give our friends that we love a better life? And if all of this is true, then it's a matter of simply going out and, and proclaiming, uh, well, I guess how Peter would, uh, Saint Peter would say it, is defending the hope that is within us. That's right. And in the end, <laughs> right, um, that's what we're all uh, here to do. Well, um, Kathy, what are, where are some places that people can um, uh, read your work or, or go find uh, the, the book? Yeah, people are familiar most with my homeschooling review website, the Kathy Duffy Reviews, but I do have uh, Evangelism for Catholics is the site I'm using for this book. They can find the book there. They can find it at uh, Catholic bookstores and on Amazon. Uh, it's, it should be readily available by now. Uh, it's been out about a month well, so Kathy Duffy, so. yeah, uh, uh, like we said one more time, uh, title, Everyday Evangelism for Catholics, A Practical Guide to Spreading the Faith in a Contemporary World. Kathy, thank you for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thanks for having Thanks, me. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, bye. Bye. Well, bud, um, I I think I asked your, you know, the type of question you usually ask right before the break. I think yeah. I asked that, like, in the middle, and that was what was confusing. No, that's right. I, 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 I almost asked what is the meaning of life before the first break, but I refrained. That's right. No, I think... That, that point that you brought up in the first part of the show, though, is so foundational that this is about extending the reign of, of Christ, and it's something that, in a sense, I mean, we don't like this language, but we owe to God. It's a matter of justice, and so to to bring others to the truth, to admonish sinners, that's at the at the heart of what we're about as Catholics. Well, and to sort of like bring it home, since we have just a few more minutes, one of the things that I guess I'm trying to get at is... Um, when you talk with young people, because sometimes I think yeah. even our evangelization efforts can see like seem like they're aimed at uh, fallen away Catholics or people. Uh, you know, part of it is like who has the most time to talk about these things, right? Twenty and thirty year olds have families or getting jobs, etc. Um, what I notice about the, the 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 kids, bud, as I call them, yeah, is it's sometimes not even a matter of purposelessness. What the purpose they have is they. I think they they want to burn the world down, bud. Like they're they're so they they have this like deep seated rage about like things that are obviously wrong, and they think that we're just like the nice people who are basically like you know eat your vegetables, chew your food, uh, you know, and, and just do what you're told. But what I think of a Second Peter chapter three ten. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be yeah. laid bare. And I go, you know what, that sort of fire in your belly, young person out there who's listening, that's not going to be quenched by the church. It's going to be given the appropriate venue for it to burn. And sometimes I think we have to like be more comfortable with our own faith yep. uh, and, and the radical ramifications of that in order to convey that message. And I think that that's something... That, like you said, uh, that the, the, the God himself is owed and that we should be happy to be a part of that fire brigade. That's right. Well, folks, this is the uncommon good. Uh, may Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, in our families, in our city, our state, our nation, the entire world, the whole galaxy, the uncommon good. We'll be back next Wednesday. There we go. I, I was about to call, bud. <laughs> They, they, yeah, the eagle's uh, sleepy today. The, the eagle ha- uh, took too much Benadryl and evidently <laughs> yeah. had uh, allergies. Um, so, yeah, you know, I don't have it right in front of me, but, you know, the big thing was we got done with a uh, carathon. And one of the things we always wrap up our show is talking about how it's not just – the show is not just us talking on air. It really is the joint effort not only of everybody behind the boards, um, but people like you who listen and donate – and uh, I'm not going to throw out the, the – I haven't heard the official number. I know it's well uh, in the, the, the six-digit range. Uh, and I want to just say thank you to everyone for being a part of this ministry and making it possible. Yeah, Bo, a point that Kathy brings up in the book that we get, didn't get to is that conversion is ultimately a work of the Holy Spirit. And so for those who might feel uncomfortable with, with evangelizing, like uh, starting a conversation on the bus, I think the foundation of spreading the gospel is through prayer. And here at Iowa Catholic Radio, you can start your day in prayer at 5.30. And then also at 9.30, there's the Iowa Catholic Radio Rosary, followed by 
a gospel reflection by Father Andrew Winchittle. Yep. If you go to Iowa Catholic Radio, you can, of course, listen to us even if you're not in range of the radio signal. Um, but you can also check out what's all going on. You can get signed up um, for In Tune with Iowa Catholic Radio, the bi-monthly newsletter that lets you know everything that's coming up. Uh, there's a man up coming up, a ladies' mosaic luncheon. Uh, the big thing, is, of course, is December 7th. Um, the, the, the winter gala, I figure, or whatever we're, uh, what we're officially calling it. Um, but all those things you can go look up there. Uh, Bud, you know, have fun at Duquesne and like, it can be like, where in Pittsburgh is Bud San Diego? Like yeah. if you call from a new place next uh, week, just, you know, describe, um, what food they are putting French fries on and then we'll go from there. Hey, maybe kayaking down the mahogany. <laughs> 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 Good luck with that. Yeah. All right. We're uh, Bud Marr. This is Bo Bonner. Uh, say, signing off from Iowa Catholic Radio Mercy Live Up Studios. This is The Uncommon Good, and we will see you all next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good.